Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this virtual professional development opportunity. My name is Joe Schmidt, and I'm the Social Studies Specialist for the Maine Department of Education. Today, we are welcoming back Thinker Analytics, and with us today, we have Nate Odie and Aidan Kastijan, and they are going to be talking about claims, reasoning, and evidence, and they're going to show you some of the resources that they have online um, that will help you assist your students in doing some of those critical thinking that we all know is very important for our students. So at this time, I'm happy to introduce and turn it over to Nate and Aiden. Yeah, hi guys. Um, my name is Nate. I'm a fellow in Harvard's philosophy department. I'm the lead instructor for Thinker Analytics. And Joe, thanks for having us. Um, setting everybody up on the Zoom. And um, I'm joined by my colleague, Aiden Kastijan. Um, Aiden, do you want to just briefly introduce yourself as well? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having us. Uh, my name is Aiden Kastijan, as you've heard <laughs> several times now. And um, I'm a program director at Thinker Analytics, and I also um, teach logic and critical thinking at the college level um, at a small liberal arts school down here uh, in the Massachusetts area. So yeah, thanks. And I'll hand it back to Nate. Awesome. Um, all right. So uh, what I thought we'd do today, guys, is we're going to show you a tool called argument mapping. And um, we can use argument mapping to discuss controversial issues as well as to help students uh, defend their claims with evidence and use reasoning to explain how their evidence supports their claims. Uh, so I'm going to do that now. And for a topic, we like to pick really controversial topics. Um, historically, we've done like whether pineapple belongs on pizza or whether a hot dog is a sandwich. For some reason, they're always food related. Um, uh, today, I actually, you know, I thought we could mix it up and you guys could tell me what topic we should use for a warm up. Um, I've got this game uh, called I Descent. I don't know if you guys have if you guys have seen this yet. It's uh, um, it's a uh, it's based on uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and uh, it's kind of fun. Joe actually put me onto it, and they have a lot of good topics in here, including whether a hot dog is a sandwich. Uh, but uh, you know, not to re you know reinvent the wheel. I thought we could do a new topic. So I've got some options for you, and you guys can tell me which one. Uh, we should do we could do whether uh, we could debate whether college is overrated that's option number one uh whether the internet makes people dumber that's option number two or whether florida is the worst state and that's option number three so um uh you know quick straw poll does anybody want to stick up for any of these topics How about internet dumber? Great. Faith says uh, the topic we should do is that the internet makes people dumber. Um, I, I did see, uh, I saw two options in this, two votes in the chat for Florida. Florida is the worst state. Okay, I think Florida is winning, okay. which maybe means that Florida is also losing. Florida is going to lose out in this conversation. All right, so we'll do whether Florida is the worst state. So uh, what I'm going to do, guys, is just share my screen with you, and I'm going to show you something called an argument map. And this is a free software tool called MindMuff, and I won't spend a lot of time today like teaching you exactly how to use MindMuff because we have a nifty tutorial that uh, you'll get access to, and you know um, we might be able to drop the link for you in the chat here, and uh, so you can spend some time on your own learning how to use MindMuff. But um, uh, what we can do is uh, just use it to map out arguments in a way that's visual and allows us to. Uh, experience an argument in a, in a visual structure in order to have a more uh, precise conversation. So uh, hopefully everyone can see my screen here. Um, and the main claim that we're going to dis discuss is whether Florida is the worst state. So Florida is the worst state will be the, the claim under discussion. And uh, in order to uh, have an argument, we would need some premises. And a premise is just a reason to believe something. So I'm hoping that uh, any of you guys might be willing to offer uh, a reason to believe that Florida is the worst state. Uh, and if there are any Floridians here, uh, I hope you don't take too much offense. Uh, I'm not from Florida, so it's easy to take pot shots uh, from the sidelines. Well, I was in Florida last week and um, I'll try to stay out of it. So there's also uh, objections. If you disagree with the claim, if you think Florida is not the worst state, uh, you can feel free to add an objection to the conversation as well. So. Anybody willing to um, come in here on uh, whether Florida is the worst state? It has dangerous wildlife. Okay, who said that? Was that Andrew? Yes. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, so Andrew says 
Uh, Florida is the worst state because Florida has dangerous wildlife. Uh, Andrew, do you have any uh, like supporting evidence for that or any specific examples? It's kind of a broad claim. Um, but I, I do. Um, there are alligators that live in, in the canals and in the Everglades. There are a variety of poisonous snakes. Um, and flamingos have always given me the creeps. <laughs> okay, Florida has many poisonous snakes. Okay, and then uh, Florida has flamingos? Yeah. Do you want to put flamingos under dangerous? Anything that pink seems dangerous to me. <laughs> okay, great. So uh, thank you, Andrew. So what Andrew's uh, given us, guys, is a couple of sub-premises, and sub-premises are reasons to believe another premise. So that hopefully is kind of intuitive because a sub-premise is something that goes underneath, right? So the premise is that uh, Florida has dangerous wildlife, and then a reason to believe that it has dangerous wildlife might be because it has alligators and because it has poisonous snakes. Um, and then we also heard that uh, Florida has flamingos and um, has pink flamingos probably, and... Um, and we had a co-premise here, uh, and the co-premise was something like, uh, you know, uh, pink creatures must be dangerous or something like that. Andrew, I don't want to misrepresent what you're saying, though. Um, that, that's a good enough sub-premise for me. <laughs> Great. So uh, what I want everyone to notice here is that Andrew has actually just given us a little bit of evidence and reasoning. And we can represent that evidence and reasoning with these, these little um, co-premise structures where we bracket them together. And I'm gonna spend a little more time on that today. Uh, but so what I'm gonna do is just label this as evidence, which is that Florida has pink flamingos. And then reasoning explains how the evidence helps to support the claim. So Andrew told me that Florida has pink flamingos and I was like, well, how does that support the claim that Florida has dangerous wildlife? And he said, well, pink creatures must be dangerous. So this is a, uh, an explanation of how the evidence helps to support the claim above it. So hopefully you guys can kind of see that, that evidence and reasoning pair working like that. Um, I'm just looking at the chat. I see a couple more people were chiming in on the snakes. Uh, discarded pet boas have been eating the indigenous wildlife. Wow, that is... Uh, I, boas aren't poisonous though, are they? They're, they're, um, they kill by constricting, right? So uh, Florida also has boas. Florida is starting to sound dangerous. Um, eating wildlife. Uh, extra points if anybody can drop like a link to a source in the chat because um, so far these are fairly unsubstantiated claims. And if you guys were students, I would be asking you to support your claims with, with substantiated sources. Um, now, I see that Donna has also chimed in to say that, is that I-4 is one of the deadliest roads in the US? Um, so that would be like perhaps a separate reason to believe that Florida is the worst state. It's not saying that Florida has dangerous wildlife, but it might be an independent premise. Um, so it might be something uh, like, I, what I would do to, to add that to my map is click the main claim here, and then say something like, uh, Florida has dangerous roads, maybe. And then one example of that would be uh, I-4 uh, is one of the deadliest roads in the US. That also seems like something that could use uh, some support in the form of a source or something. Andrew has a link for us on the uh, alligators. Great. So it seems like you guys just think Florida is a dangerous, and maybe it is. Okay, so what I'm gonna do guys is I'm gonna take Andrew's source link and um, what I can do is I can add it to a box and it will create a link. So you can see if I like just paste the link. Oh, oops, I wanna copy Andrew's source. Great. Well, the, given that the title is that it's surprisingly rare for an alligator to kill a person, ah. uh, this is not making me think that Florida is especially dangerous. I'll, uh, I'm definitely open to getting a, getting a fresh source on that one though. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna fold up this uh, box to make it a little more convenient. Now D says that Florida has dangerous weather patterns. Uh, so I'm gonna add that over here. And that also, I could use some examples or, um, how many of you guys have lived in Florida before?
Oh, Dorothy says it was pythons. Are pythons poisonous or are they also constrictors? This is quickly getting out of my death. <laughs> pythons. Dorothy says constrictors. Okay. So pythons is not just poisonous snakes. So it seems like overall, you guys think Florida is really dangerous. So I'm just going to create a bucket claim called Florida is dangerous. <laughs> and then I'm going to attach uh, all of these other claims under here, because these are all different ways that Florida is dangerous. I guess the state is just a hazardous place to live. Um, OK, so Dorothy gave us a source for the Python's claim. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy that source. And I should be able to um, paste it here in this box, if it'll let me copy the source. Um, there we go. OK, so you see what I just did? Uh, this is a nifty thing that MindMup will let you do, is it'll let you link something like this. Um, so I just pasted the source in there. It looks like it's a New York Times article. And uh, if I click this now, it will take me to that New York Times article. So that's kind of a, a nifty thing uh, that you can do. Well, you guys are finding lots of examples of evidence of how dangerous Florida is. Um, I would suggest that if anybody's willing to stick up for Florida, that would be useful as well. Because I see um, we have some more evidence about Florida being dangerous on the roads. Oops. Let's see if I can do this. No, that's still the Python article. Dangerous highway. Great. So I'm going to copy this link. And I'm going to paste it here. Great. So that's how I can get the link to that source. I'll share this map with you guys when I'm done. Looks like alligator attacks are on the rise. <laughs> Andrew is not letting the alligators go. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. All right. Um, is anybody willing to uh, disagree with anything that we've already said here or um, maybe offer an objection or a reason to believe that Florida is not so bad? I don't know if any of you guys like Tom Brady, but he lives in Florida now. Joe says that Florida has no state income tax. OK, great. So um, what I want you guys to see is that uh, the claim that Florida has no state income tax is not responding to any of the claims that are already in my map. So it's not directly disagreeing that Florida has alligators or pink flamingos. Rather, it's just disagreeing with the claim that Florida is the worst state. So the appropriate place to put the objection is directly to the main claim, rather than responding to one of these other claims here. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go click Add Objection and say something like, Florida has no uh, state income tax. Now, I'm hoping you guys can help me here. So this is evidence, but... Um, what is the reasoning that Joe needs to connect his evidence to the, to the claim? So if Joe wants to say that Florida is not the worst state and he gives me some evidence that Florida has no income tax, what is the reasoning there? What is the explanation of how the evidence helps to support the claim? It might almost be so obvious that you wouldn't think to say it. But it is the kind of thing you might want a student to spell out explicitly. I need to connect this evidence to the claim. Good. So Darren says no income tax means more money in your pocket. Good. Yeah, exactly. So um, the, the reasoning needs to be something about how no income tax is a good thing, right? Because just saying it has no income tax is kind of neutral. It doesn't really give you a reason one way or another, unless we also believe that um, no income tax is good for citizens, um, maybe because uh, more money in your pocket. You're not good for the roads though. But what I want you guys to see is that this reasoning is the sort of like hidden uh, thing that is often very hard for students to explain, which is how does their evidence help to support their claim? And once again, we can kind of represent evidence and reasoning with these little co-premise structures, just like I did for the pink flamingos down there. So you can put the statement of how the evidence helps to support the claim in a co-premise like this. Okay, um, let's do just a few more. Um, 
let's see. D says, Florida is a fantastic place to visit with family. Uh, Dorothy says Florida is sunny and sun is good for one's health. Okay, I'm going to do Dorothy's here because that's another example of um, evidence and reasoning. So uh, Florida is sunny is a piece of evidence. And then the reasoning is that sun is good for one's health. And then a reason to believe that is that sun gives you vitamin D. So what I want you guys to see is that these two statements are working together to provide one single reason to believe the claim above. And I'll just tell you, I think that's a fairly persuasive reason uh, uh, because I really like the sun and it makes me happy. So uh, again, I just want you guys to see that this is an example of evidence and this is an example of reasoning. So nice job. Uh, I think it was Dorothy who gave me that. And then this is a reason to believe that the reasoning piece is true. Aiden just dropped uh, the link uh, to the mind map how to guide in the chat. Thank you, Aiden. Okay. Um, a lot of other people said it's, it's a great place to visit uh, with family. Cool. Um, so uh, another thing I just wanted to show you guys that we can do with mind map, and then we'll spend a little more time focusing on evidence and reasoning specifically is uh, that I, I kind of gestured toward it here, but you can evaluate the strength of a reason or of an objection by just clicking on it and indicating whether you think it's strong or weak. So um, is anybody willing to tell me, uh, like pick one of these reasons and tell me whether you think it's strong or weak? Ruth asks, why would we place this under Florida is the worst state? So Ruth, um, what I have been doing here is in red, I've been giving reasons not to believe the main claim. So in red is an objection. So it's a reason to believe that Florida is not the worst state, but maybe that Florida is a good state to live in or something like that. So these ones are in red, they're objections. The stuff in green, these are supports for the claim. So the, the support, the, the claim that Florida is dangerous is a reason to believe it's the worst state. Yep, no, it's a good question. Uh, but yeah, is anybody willing to evaluate? So what we did is we laid out some argument here and hopefully you guys are able to follow the discussion because of the visual structure. Um, is anybody willing to uh, offer an evaluation of one of these reasons? Do you find it persuasive or not? Are you guys convinced that Florida is the worst state? Next time we can do Maine. Great. So Lauren says Florida has dangerous roads is strong with the reasoning of I-4. Good. So um, Laura, Lauren, I think what you're um, saying here is that you think that this is a strong support, meaning the fact that uh, I-4 is one of the deadliest roads in the U.S. gives me a good reason to believe that Florida has dangerous roads. Um, so this is a strong reason to believe that this is true. Um, and I would tend to agree with you here. Um, if it is one of the deadliest roads in the U.S., that is a, that is a convincing reason that Florida has dangerous roads. Yeah. Any other uh, evaluations of any of the any of the reasons here? You guys find it convincing or not? I would say that the dangerous wildlife and poisonous snakes. I wouldn't want to go to a state with poisonous snakes. Not <laughs> okay. Great. So um, you're saying that uh, the fact that it has dangerous wildlife is a good reason to believe that Florida is dangerous. You find this persuasive? Yeah, I mean, I would find that persuasive. Mm -hmm. I also um, looked up the website, a website, and it said that there's also like poisonous spiders. So. Oh, geez. Yeah, like there's one that has small, like one of the spiders is small, but it has like venom in it. <laughs> So, Yikes. yeah. So Florida is full of all kinds of dangerous things, especially flamingos. Great. So uh, it sounds like you guys are finding like this section of the argument pretty persuasive that Florida has dangerous wildlife. Um, now, I, I got to ask you, um, do you do you find it? Uh, I mean, I don't know what the like statistics are, but uh, do you think you're really substantially more likely to die from wildlife in Florida compared to somewhere else? Like, do, does your does your life expectancy go down when you step into the state of Florida because of the wildlife? It goes down because there are so many elderly people. <laughs> okay, so you think the elderly people are a hazard to your health or? 
I mean, um, you know, you could argue that uh, you might expect to live a long time if so many elderly people make it in Florida. Yeah, but they're they're draining the resources which are not being funded because there's no income tax. Ah, good. Okay, so it sounds like Andrew takes issue with the, the idea that no income tax is good for citizens. Uh, Andrew is going to object to that and say, well, actually, no income tax means uh, no resources uh, for, for citizens. It's all those darn old people taking up their resources. Good. Um, all right. Uh, so thank you guys for kind of playing along there. I just wanted to kind of show you the tool um, and hopefully you guys can see, maybe even imagine yourselves doing this with your students. Um, one of the nice things about MindMup is it works just as well on Zoom as in a real classroom. Um, so you could just project this on the board and either you can do it or your students can do it. Um, Aiden did drop the tutorial doc in there. And um, if you wanna have your students start using MindMup to map out their claims or to lead a class discussion, um, the students actually get up and running with it pretty quickly and they're pretty intuitive about it. So um, they're usually able to, to start um, making the kind of arguments that we just did here uh, with a little bit of practice. So um, that's kind of mind map. And then I, I wanted to show you guys, introduce you to this evidence and reasoning piece. Um, and uh, yeah, next time we can debate whether Maine uh, uh, is the best state to live in. All right. Um, I guess I'll pause. Are there any questions about mind map um, or kind of any of the moves that I made while I was using it or um, how to use it in a discussion or anything else for that matter? One quick question. Mm -hmm. um, so no income tax means no resource for no resources for citizens. Um, for me, that looks like it would be supporting the claim for Florida is the worst state. So I would want to make that green. Am I yeah. correct? And if so, could you show me how to change the color? Because it looks like it would still need to fall under no income tax is good for citizens. Yeah, so um, I'm glad you brought that up. It's, it's a little bit confusing because you're right that this is ultimately supporting the claim that Florida is the worst state. Um, the red denotes a local, it denotes that this is a reason not to believe this. So the red is explaining that this 3.4 here is a reason not to believe 2.3. And then 2.3 is red because it's a reason not to believe the main claim. So it's sort of like a response to the objection, right. uh, which, which means that it does support the main claim. I realize that's a little perhaps unintuitive because you might think like everything in favor of the main claim would all be in green and everything against the main claim would all be in red. But what the red in this case means is that this is a reason not to believe this, which ultimately means that it is a reason to believe the main claim because this is also an objection. So it's, it's, it's an objection to an objection. Right. Thank does you. that answer your question? It does, yes, thank you. I, I do realize that's um, a little unintuitive and there's, uh, unfortunately there's no good solution that we found for that because it also becomes confusing if I make this green because it's this is a reason not to believe this. Right, right. Could you use a third color? You could. Um, we don't currently have a third color for this. What you could do is you can actually change the color of the node if that would be um, more illuminating. So you could turn that orange or something if you wanted to. Could you show me that again? Sure, yeah. You just right click uh, any box and you click node style okay. and then you can change the background color. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, students like to use these. Um, and sometimes we use um, like yellow and blue to label evidence and reasoning. Yeah. I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed at the top of your screen, it says share. Can yep. students collaborate on the same mind map uh, quite easily? Or is the sharing function more just for like a student to turn it into a teacher? You're gonna wanna use it more that way. It does integrate with Google Drive and so uh, you can see I'm logged into my Gmail account here. And if I click share, it will like allow me to share it just like any other Google file. Um, so in that sense, it does work intuitively like you'd think it would. Um, the real-time collaboration is a little slow because um, you know how like on Google Docs, you can like be like, it's, it's completely synchronous. And so you can be like typing and you can see other people's cursors and it's, it's really smooth. 
it's not quite that smooth on MindMup. So what we usually suggest, because MindMup isn't like a Google native app, it's like a third party app. Um, we suggest that uh, you have students, if they want to, if you do want them to collaborate, but um, it's actually better for one student to share their screen and for other students to talk and in the manner that you, that we all just did, um, because that actually gets students using the language of argument and they're more likely to uh, have a more robust conversation and get better at the skills um, because they're being forced to like use the language of argument uh, and to collaborate verbally rather than if they're all silently typing at their own computers, um, the, the uh, learning is not as rich. So we suggest that you have them do that if possible. Um, but yeah, you can certainly have them share their maps with you. Um, and then what you can do is also make comments on them. So uh, like I could come down here and I could say um, source uh, for this <laughs> or something like that. So I use this little sticky note feature uh, as a teacher to make comments on students' maps uh, when they share them with me. Cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, Julie asks, is there a way to change the numbering? Um, there's a way to hide the numbering. So if you click argument visualization and you go down to hide hierarchical labels, it'll make the numbers go away. Um, so uh, you can use that if you just want the numbers to disappear. Uh, if you wanted to change the numbers, um, so I'll bring them back. Um, the best way to, to change them is to just like shuffle uh, the claims. So if I like drag this and move it, then it will change the order of the claims. Um, but there isn't a very straightforward way to just edit the number in the box that I know of. Any other questions about mine? Great. Um, by the way, if you want to use this as a tool for students to plan a piece of writing, um, you know, as you saw, you can have them like add links uh, to their sources like this. Um, but you can also go up here and click file and then go download as and then download it as an outline. And that will allow them to it'll generate like a bullet point document that they can you know use as an outline to start writing their draft. And that's kind of handy because um, then students can spend a lot of time actually really making their argument really sharp in MindMup. And all of their work will be preserved when they go to write their draft. All the sources will be there. Um, so they won't just kind of um, shortcut it because they're afraid of wasting time doing extra work, things like that. Uh, you know, they, they, you really want them to put a lot of intentionality into planning their argument in the mind map. And then um, once their mind map is really sharp, the draft kind of writes itself. Okay. Well, please um, let me know if you guys have any other questions about using MindMup. Um, and, you know, take a look through that tutorial doc. Um, uh, Aiden and I will leave our email addresses in here, and we're super happy to um, answer any questions you guys might have about it. Um, and you know, we'll even be happy to like schedule a one-on-one -on -one tutorial with you, or um, you know, just just kind of do a quick Zoom session to show you how to use it, or um, answer any individual questions you may have. We really want to um, help you guys feel comfortable with using it. So um, that's what I'll say about MindMup. How are we doing for time? Okay, um, I want to tell you guys a little bit more about evidence and reasoning and uh, give you a few examples of practice exercises that we can do with that. And I'll put you on our course and we'll get you on our way because uh, hopefully we can wrap early today because I know that uh, you guys are on break. So um, extra, extra points for even showing up today. Um, so uh, just some definitions here. Um, a premise, as I told you guys earlier, was uh, just a claim that gives a reason to believe another claim. Uh, so nothing too fancy. And evidence is a kind of premise and specifically it gives concrete, specific or factual information in order to support a claim. So the claim that Florida has flamingos is a piece of evidence or that I-4 is the one of the most dangerous roads in the US. Uh, so this, you know, in your guys' context as social studies teachers, frequently it's gonna look like a quote from a text or a historical source or a piece of data. And then reasoning is the kind of tricky part um, that I'm sure you guys are all at least somewhat frustrated with how you get your students to do this. And uh, in particular, that's explaining how or why the evidence helps to prove the claim. So uh, we've heard from a lot of teachers that frequently, sometimes students just can't provide any evidence or the evidence they provide is totally irrelevant. But even when they do provide true and relevant evidence, they have a hard time explaining how that evidence helps to prove their claim. They'll just kind of like list the evidence. 
um, instead of actually stitching it back to the claim they're trying to support. So um, we've developed some practice exercises that can show you how to do that using uh, co-premises. So co-premises are this structure that I was showing you earlier where you have two boxes together under one bracket like this. And the evidence, we usually just put it on the left and then the reasoning, we put it on the right. Um, and it fits this nifty little co-premise structure. So what that allows us to do is to um, do practice reps with filling in the missing reasoning uh, to explain how the evidence supports the claim. So um, this is an example uh, from the book, Things Fall Apart. Um, and the claim is that in Things Fall Apart, the locusts represent the colonizers. And then there's a quote from the text that says, at last the locusts did descend, they settled on every tree and on every blade of grass. And so the student has done a, a decent job of giving us a piece of textual evidence to support the claim. Uh, but the question is, what is the reasoning? So how does this evidence support the claim? Can we explain the relevance of the evidence to the claim uh, in a succinct way? So um, I'm wondering if any of you guys would be willing to um, take a swipe at it. What, what do you think? What is, what is the explanation of how the evidence supports the claim here? So Dorothy says reasoning, yep, Andrew, good. Colonial powers descend upon places and exploit the resources and people, good. Yeah, the author used locus as a metaphor. Good, they did descend and are everywhere, good. Yep, yeah, it sounds like you guys are nailing it. So um, I had something like descending and settling is what the colonizers did, yeah. And hopefully you can see that there's actually this kind of like little triangle structure between the claim and the evidence and the reasoning. So uh, we have the concept of the locus that appeared in the main claim and it appeared in our evidence. And um, then we also have this concept of descending and settling and that appeared in the evidence, but not in the main claim. So it needed to show up somewhere in the reasoning. And then likewise, the concept of the colonizers appeared in the claim, but not in the evidence. So essentially I knew I needed something about descending and settling here. And I also knew I needed something about colonizers in order to connect the evidence to the claim, because those are the kind of concepts that were kind of left dangling uh, when we didn't have the reasoning filled in. So uh, you can actually you know, start to see this triangle structure. Uh, and I could show you guys perhaps in the map uh, that we already generated together how that looks. Um, but it's kind of this cool x-ray vision that you can start to get into the logic of arguments. Um, so I think that's kind of fun. Um, and if that's helpful to you to start thinking about what the reasoning is, Great, if it's um, not helpful, like if I just confused you by showing you these colors and these bubbles, then like, don't stress it. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's not uh, necessary. Let me do another example. Uh, claim is that in the middle ages, China was a more advanced society than Europe. And the evidence for that is that the Chinese invented gunpowder, the movable type and compasses long before they were seen in Europe. So once again, I'll ask you guys, what's the reasoning? So it, I think it's a decent piece of evidence, um, but I want my student to explain sort of so what, how does that evidence um, help to support the claim? Good, Faith, yeah, Faith said military protection, communication and navigation. Daniel says technological advancements are a key mark of a thriving society. Good, so I think what Daniel's done is he's connected the idea of these technological advancements uh, to a society being more advanced. So I had something like that. Um, I said, the invention of new powerful technologies demonstrates society's level of advancement. And once again, I've got this kind of like cool triangle structure here. So I had the concept of China in the main claim and the evidence was about China. So that was kind of taken care of, but what the, this evidence didn't say anything about being more advanced. So I needed something about a society being advanced in this missing reasoning. 
And then I needed to say something about these technologies. And so I just needed to be very explicit about explaining that new and powerful technologies demonstrate society's level of advancement. So often the reasoning is something that um, might seem obvious and perhaps it's so obvious to a student that they don't even think to say it, right? Because if you just gave me the evidence, you might not think to you know, also say or explain this point here. But unfortunately, uh, it might be obvious to your students, but it's not always obvious to us as teachers, right? And so that's why we want them to be very explicit about connecting their evidence to their claims. Um, I know that I kind of threw a lot at you guys just now because it's kind of a, a tricky little skill. Um, and if you're finding that it's kind of hard, that's because it is hard. <laughs> um, are there any questions about this or um, comments? I think the idea of triangle for creating an argument is a concrete visual way for students to, to think about how to both use evidence and explain its importance. Yep, uh, I actually happen, I like that it's also triangular because it's almost like building a structure, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, I guess one thing I'm wondering about is for higher level students, like mm -hmm. once they've got the knack of this and you're trying to build in evaluation mm -hmm. of either the claims or evidence, like how would that fit into the triangle structure or how could you visually like make a spot for that so they don't forget about sort of counter claims and evaluation? Yeah, it's a great question. Um... We don't have kind of the time or space right in this moment to totally unpack that, but um, we've got a bunch of things that, first of all, in our online course, we've got a lot of practice exercises with evaluating arguments. And just briefly, the, the short answer is the, the method that we teach students to evaluate whether an argument is any good is first you point at a box and ask, is it true? And then you point at a support connection and ask, is it strong? So first you would ask like, is this evidence true here? Is it true that the Chinese invented gunpowder along before, you know, and these, these things before they were seen in Europe? And in order to evaluate whether that's true, you'd have to like look at a source or something, right? Which is what you guys are experts in because you're social studies teachers. Um, and then you would also have to point at this box and ask, is this true? So if you find it to be the case that the invention of new powerful technologies does demonstrate society's level of advancement or like this is a, a plausible claim. So you point at a box and ask, is it true? And then, like I said, the next move is to point at this inference and ask, is it strong? So if you believe both the evidence and the reasoning, does that give you a good reason to believe the main claim? And then that's the part where you might um, click on the, um, remember how I was uh, clicking on like uh, this piece here? So you could, if you, if you found both this evidence and this reasoning to be persuasive or to be true, then you could also decide whether the inference is strong or weak. Uh, and then finally, you can add your own objections. Um, so I think that was your last uh, point there was uh, you could also ask the students uh, if they have a different reason to, to disagree with the, with the main claim or consider a counterclaim would be a different way of saying it. Um, and if you do that, then you could maybe add a box in red or something like that. Does that kind of answer your question? I know it wasn't uh, the full yeah. package, but. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in our online course, we've got a lot of, we've got very short videos and practice exercises that will help students to evaluate arguments. Anything else about evidence and reasoning before I show you guys the, the course? Okay, um, great. So uh, I guess I wanted to just make you guys aware of our course. Um, it's free for teachers to use, and um, it's because we're a nonprofit, it's free for any students. If, if for any reason, we, we are charging $5 a seat for students, but um, if for any reason, we don't want you or your students paying out of your own pockets. So if your school doesn't have, you know, any, if your department doesn't have any money, then um, just let us know and we'll make it free for you too. Because um, we're more interested in you guys just getting value out of it than getting your $5. <laughs> um, but uh, 
what what I have here is like lesson um, 6.3, uh, for example, is where we do um, evidence, or sorry, 6.2 is where we do evidence and reasoning. But the, the basic way you should think about this course is it's like a boot camp for arguments. So it's not like a lot of me talking and students listening. It's a lot of short videos, like less than five minutes, and then lots of practice exercises of the sort that we were just doing. So like in lesson 6.2 here, um, it's me kind of doing the, the short little lecture I just gave you guys. And then importantly, there's a series of practice exercises. And what students are doing when they're doing the practice exercises is trying to achieve a streak. So here they're trying to get like a streak of three in a row. So here, um, let's just do this one together. Uh, it says, is the airplane on the ground or in the air? The claim is that the airplane is on the ground. The evidence is that there are people in white suits who don't look like passengers. And the question is, what is the reasoning? And here are your answer options. Anybody uh, want to take a swipe at answering this one? I'm going to take a wild guess and say an airplane would probably not leave the ground with non-passengers on board. Good. Yep. So that's an explanation of how the evidence helps to support the claim. Nice. That's what I was thinking too. So um, here, uh, every single practice exercise in the course has a little bit of explanation of the correct answer. And you can see that we've got our first in a row. We're trying to get a streak of three in a row correct. And once we get three in a row, the course will give us credit for this particular skill. And we'll move on to the next quiz or the next video. So uh, there's a lot of like lessons in here with, like I said, short videos and then lots of practice exercises. Um, and, and again, you should think of it like a critical thinking boot camp. So, or, or maybe like the analogy that I like is like a weight room. So um, you guys are out there like coaching your sports and you want your students to be able to scrimmage and you're giving them like all the skills they need to, I don't know, like just go with me here, but like, I don't know, shoot three pointers or like do layups, right? Because that's what you guys are experts in. Um, and what we've done is tried to build like a, a weight room where students can go just do lots of reps to get stronger logic muscles so that when they go out and play, you know, basketball, <laughs> it, you know, if you can extend the metaphor, uh, that they'll have those skills, right? Because you want them to have the skills of evidence and reasoning and identifying claims and, um, you know, figuring out are these independent premises or uh, explaining, you know, what is their evidence and, and evaluating arguments. You want them to have those skills when you're talking about, um, you know, your content and your subject matter. So we're kind of like the, the, the weight room so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can kind of outsource the, the logic muscle stuff to us. That's the way uh, that we like to try to explain it. So you can create a free teacher account if you just land on our site. Um, and uh, it'll automatically bounce you to the registration page and there's a place to register a, a free teacher account. You can start poking around. Someone asked, what age group is this geared towards? Can my sixth graders participate in this course? Um, yeah, you could give it a shot. I would actually, Ruth, I would love to know if you're sick. That's about the edge of where we've tested it. Um, it certainly has worked with eighth and ninth graders. Um, I think sixth graders could at least get through the first couple of lessons if you gave them um, some kind of scaffolding and uh, if you were patient with them um, and they were patient with themselves. Um, I would genuinely love to know um, how sixth graders do with it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Daniel says, can students, uh, someone asked about fifth grade, uh, same answer. Like I'd be, we, we, we're, uh, constantly being asked uh, to go like earlier grades. And so um, my other answer to that, uh, Dorothy and Ruth, is um, if you want to come work for us this summer and build the fifth grade version of this course, we'll pay you to do it. So um, seriously, uh, th that'd be great. Um, Daniel asked, can students when using this program hop around the lessons? Uh, they can hop around. That's right. The, the course won't restrict them from moving forward or jumping to different lessons. Um, although I would encourage you to encourage your students to move through it in order because it's it's a little bit like math where it kind of builds on itself. So if you like try to skip ahead, you might um, miss something. Yeah. Yeah, Dorothy, I'm serious about, um, you know, uh, email us. And um, if you want to work on um, building out this stuff for fifth graders, we'd be we'd be definitely interested in talking about it. Nate, I wonder if this is a good time to return to Pamela's question from the beginning about just oh, yeah. uh, 
persuasion and arguments versus description um just because that's kind of the beginning of yeah the yeah for sure i'm so glad you asked that uh pamela and thanks for the reminder aiden so um in lesson one we explain what an argument is which is just um uh, communication that's designed to persuade, especially by giving reasons. So as opposed to other kinds of persuasion, like by manipulating or um, insulting people or coercion or, um, you know, anything that you guys have seen on social media or the internet lately. And then we also distinguish arguments from dis from descriptions. So, um, and hopefully this gets to your question, Pamela. So in an argument, the speaker's goal is to convince you of their main claim. And in a description, their goal is just to inform or entertain you. So some examples of things that would be descriptions are like news stories or Wikipedia pages, uh, book summaries, or just historical narratives, right? So the question is like, what's the speaker's goal here? And uh, are they trying to convince me of a main claim by giving reasons, or are they just trying to inform or entertain me? And then um, here in these slides, we've got an example of a practice exercise, and we've got um, dozens of them in the course where we just want students to distinguish an argument from a description. So um, Let's just do one practice example together. So is anybody willing to read this slide for me? I can. Go for it. Um, argument or description. J Juneteenth is a historical celebration of the ending of slavery in the United States. On June 19th, 1865, Union soldiers landed at Galveston, Texas with news that the Civil War had ended and that enslaved Black Americans were now free. This was two and a half years after President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863. Great, thanks, Lauren. Um, so yeah, what do you guys think? Argument or description? Description, because it's not trying to convince us of something, it's informing us. Good. Andrew says description. Daniel says description. Yep. I second that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, great. Uh, here's one more. Can I get a different reader? And then uh, I'll let you guys go. I know we're pushing up against our time here. I'll volunteer. Argument or description. Many Americans have not been properly educated about Juneteenth, which is one reason why it should be a national holiday. Another reason is that if we want to celebrate America's Independence Day on July 4th, then we should also have a day to celebrate Black Americans finally gaining freedom from slavery. Excellent, thank you, Andrew. So what do you guys think on this one? You guys said argument? I see a lot of folks saying argument. I'd love if someone is willing to tell me why is it an argument and not a description. Pretend I'm a student who doesn't see it. What's different between this one and the last one? It's kind of like persuading us why these things should happen compared to the other one where it was just describing it. Persuading us of what, Lauren? Um, like another um we haven't been properly educated and um if we want to celebrate independence day on july 4th then we should also give black americans um a day to celebrate what like they're gaining freedom from slavery mm -hmm. yeah so what's the main claim of this argument what's the primary thing the speaker wants you to believe that Juneteenth should be a national holiday. Good, yeah. So uh, an argument always has a main claim. And in this case, you can see uh, the main claim is that it should be a national holiday. And you can got these clues. You guys are right to point out the phrase is one reason why and another reason. Those are clues uh, to uh, this being the main claim. So the quick test for a student is like, is there a main claim or not? If there's a if there's a if there's a punchline that uh, the author wants us to believe, then it's an argument. Um, and if they're giving us reasons, so anyway, um, Pamela, thanks for the great question, and uh, I hope this was a little bit illuminating. And uh, in our online course, um, uh, what we've got here are in lesson one, um, as you might guess, we've got just uh, dozens of practice exercises where students decide uh, whether something is an argument or a description. Uh, in this case, they're trying to get four in a row uh, correct. 
So um, I'll drop the link to the course in the chat. And um, that's pretty much all I have uh, for you guys. But I'm happy to stick around and answer any questions. Uh, you know, and please email us um, if you want to use the course and you're having any questions or issues, or um, if you want to know what I really think about Florida or um, anything like that. We'd love to chat with you guys. And thanks again, Joe, for having us. In. Does anybody have any questions for Nate? Last call, does anybody have any questions for Nate or Aiden? I'm seeing a lot of thank yous in the chat, so I don't see any questions coming through. So thank you again, Nate and Aiden, for stopping by and spending an hour of your time with Maine Educators. We greatly appreciate you. Thanks for having us, Joe. Thank you. It was a good time. Great afternoon. Yeah.